Welcome to episode 11 of Matt O'Donnell Wants to Know, a podcast to feed our curious minds. I am Matt O'Donnell, and I want to know who you are. I want to know what you do. I want to know why there is so much dust in my bedroom. I know everybody's got a million solutions, but all I'm telling you is that I'm using four to five of them all at the same time, and there is way too much dust. If you have like a legit solution, that is Matt O'Donnell wants to know at gmail.com, please and thank you. I want to know what matters to you and why. I've spent the past 15 years as a professional bass player. That means I've covered a lot of miles and talked with a lot of people. I've found that the person deeply interested in a topic is often more interesting than the topic itself, and the bigger picture is found in the details. That makes for a fantastic excuse to share conversations with people who I think are great. There are no real updates today besides to let you know that I am overwhelmed by the positive support for the show as it continues on, so thank you so much. Let's get right into it. On this episode, I will be talking with Chelsea O'Leary, who is the founder and mastermind of the Wiley Canning Company. Chelsea has made it her mission to teach, share, and, no pun intended, preserve the long-storied tradition of home food preservation. Her recent book, The Wiley Canning Company Cookbook, is a seriously complete guide to the foundation that anyone can use to hang on to seasonal foods through the techniques of canning, pickling, preserving, and freezing. You, dear listener... (laughs) may think that this is just a tradition from some dust bowl cellar culture, but I can corroborate that this is just as relevant and vibrant for the here and now as it was when the patina your mind is creating took root. You'll hear us cover all the stuff, Chelsea's family history with the art of canning, her philosophies, and her love for it. Really, I can't sell it any better here at the beginning than we will when you hear the talk. So let me tell you about experiencing Chelsea the human. Taping this talk was maybe only the third or fourth time that I had spoken to Chelsea. Most of my exposure to her comes through the fact that she is a friend and gigantic supporter of my wife, Amanda, and her business. I knew who she was, and I had heard a lot of things about her, but I didn't meet her until we went together to the launch of Chelsea's book, which included a talk moderated by Chef Sean Brock. You couldn't hear that talk for more than a few minutes without really being drawn in by Chelsea's thoughtfulness, her pace, and the way that she just exudes knowledge and gratitude and so many other things with a calmness and genuineness. Based on both that talk and going through the Wiley Canning Company cookbook, I knew that at some point she was definitely going to have to be a guest on the show. So when we booked the time for the conversation, I wasn't really sure what that was going to be like. I just described how I perceive her, and then there's me, I, if you have listened to any of the other episodes, uh, hopefully some of you have, (laughs) you can know that I will ramble, I can be a little excitable, depending on what comes up, so I wasn't sure if it was going to be a styles clash, really. I was really stunned how that kindness and quietness and thoughtfulness that Chelsea exudes drew me into really be the same speed. So if I'm being honest, I think that quality alone really made for 
a much more productive and sort of digging deep kind of conversation. I loved this discussion, and I hope that you will as well. I would normally save this for the end, but I hope that after you hear this talk, you'll consider going to WileyCanningCompany.com and exploring more of the stuff there. Chelsea really does an incredible job of presenting everything about Wiley as inviting, warm, and comfortable, and with a simmering level of inspiring. Also, the Wiley Canning Company cookbook is full of her own photography, her own words, a really complete package. Uh, I would encourage you to pick it up from her directly at her website, though it is available elsewhere. Anyway, please enjoy this wonderful conversation with Chelsea O'Leary. No, I guess going through as a bunch of your stuff as I did this morning, I feel like I just need you to life coach me. <laughs> That's very kind. That's very kind. I mean, I don't necessarily know that uh, coaches even have to have it all together uh, to do it, uh, but at least the intention of the things that you find important are the things that are like, that would be nice. Thank you. I certainly do not have it all together, but I absolutely does. totally, totally. I do my best to really give as much thoughtfulness and slowness yeah. to the big decisions I make or my big life buckets, if you will. I thought it was interesting that you just said slowness. Maybe the first thing that came to mind once I knew that you were coming on and thinking about it is uh, after having a photographer on for the last episode, right. I was thinking about your photography. And both Robbie and Ross are people who are very good at capturing motion mm -hmm. or, you know, things, things happening. There's a lot of energy in that. Right. You, on the other hand, capture stillness in a very incredible way thank you in a way that doesn't seem it doesn't seem static but it seems still i like that differentiation i certainly want my photos to to feel like they have life and breath to them right mm -hmm. so when i think about capturing let's say something as still as a peach sitting in sunlight. I'm mm -hmm. very intentional about the movement of the light over the peach because even though there's stillness, I still want it to feel very alive mm -hmm. and think about that quite often when photographing fruits and vegetables specifically or flowers or anything, like you said, that is still but not static. Yeah. There's a certain quality to older still life painting, still life photography that feels dusty and you have none of that involved while maintaining that thing. Thank you. Especially in a world of digital photography and iPhone photography, of which there are many incredible examples of, but there's there's emotion on the photographer side as well not just on the subject side right and i think that your stillness that you do a lot of embodying of is also like you you manage to make that present on both sides of the camera whereas other people seem to be only able to have the subject be still but you can tell that they are not still mm -hmm. that makes and sense so i think that you make that happen well thank you so much i really enjoy it and Certainly prioritize shooting inanimate objects more than animate. I think the work people like Robbie and Joseph do is far more difficult in a way because every moment is fleeting in their work and they are really capturing these precise, these very precise moments in time. Yeah. 
Whereas my approach to photography, I have so much more control because my subjects are often inanimate. Right. It's almost as if what I'm doing is a completely different sport, right? Sure, absolutely. Because they, it is so motionless. So I have so much respect for people like Joseph and Robbie who are capturing such profound moments amidst very fast motion. It's very hard to do well. And I think yeah. both of them do it very well. Yeah, they absolutely do. I think where that leads me to is also in the same spirit that I think that you are doing with taking photos for things. I want to go ahead and dive right into the Wiley stuff. Let's do it. Because you, in that same spirit, I think have managed to take something like canning mm -hmm. that seems very dusty yeah. in the way that we, the general person would perceive it and make it this very alive, modern, and vibrant thing. Definitely. And so tell me about that. Tell me about those concepts. Definitely. Or tell me about Wiley in general and maybe through that, that lens, sort of. For sure. So I founded Wiley Canning Company in July 2020. And my priority is to preserve food long term. So through Wiley, I write recipes and I teach classes about how to save our food long term through canning, pickling, and preservation. And this really is rooted in a deep family history. My grandmother canned nearly full time from the spring season until autumn every single year. My grandparents were farmers and my grandmother's role in that was putting up a lot of the produce that they grew on their land. Mm -hmm. And she incorporated these canned goods into almost every recipe she created for her family, of which I feel very privileged to have been a part of. Sure, absolutely. And when I left for college at the age of 18, I started interacting with food very differently, right? I didn't have access to yeah. her beautiful cellar and pantry of all of these freshly canned goods. And over time, really started to miss that closeness with my ingredients and that closeness with my food. And so as I was creating a life of my own in college and after college, I asked myself about the values rooted in my past that I wanted to carry forward, that I missed and longed for. And mm. this approach to food was one of those things. There were things I certainly wanted to let go of. And there were things I wanted to keep, but potentially tweak. Mm -hmm. But this very simple and close relationship with food was something I simply wanted to continue. I didn't want to change it at all. I just yeah. wanted to further incorporate it into my own life. And so I started pickling onions and canning tomatoes and cooking and interacting with food in this way. And it just grew into beginning to share it with friends, beginning to teach, and eventually it became Wiley. Mm -hmm. So now I spend my time writing about food preservation, writing about how valuable and meaningful it is, and teaching this skill set and really this philosophy with anyone who's willing to participate. Sure, yeah. And although it's been a practice and really necessity for many, many years and still a necessity for many families. For me, it's a chosen practice. Mm -hmm. But even though it's been around for now hundreds of years, it has really stood the test of time. And I think when we think about home food preservation, you're exactly correct. We do think about a dusty pantry or a dusty ball jar sitting high on a shelf or yeah. something like that. But as human beings, we will always need to eat, right? This Absolutely. is not this is not a necessity that will come and go. We That's have right. to nurture ourselves. So paying close attention to how we treat our food and how we treat the practice of food preparation and food waste reduction is and will forever be a very relevant topic for human beings, Absolutely, right? Absolutely, yeah. And when I think about 
this truth, you know, and I when I think about building meaning in everyday life, food is something we interact with guaranteed every single day, multiple times a day. So if we can create meaning and value around mealtime, that means we can create meaning and value in our lives every single day, right? Mm -hmm. So Wiley has really brought to my life so much daily meaning as well as true career fulfillment. So yes, this approach to food has been around for a long time, but it's it is and will always be, in my opinion, highly relevant and accessible. It's a very accessible practice. That's interesting, mostly because, and this is probably the uh, first generation removed New Yorker. Yeah, yeah. But I think of canning and preservation as something that has, or not has, for some time, fallen out of favor. Mm-hmm. As I practice, maybe that's just my perception of being in the Northeast in a non particularly farming area and stuff like that. Absolutely. And so I guess it's my perception that it feels like we probably through the dawn of any kind of food establishment, you know, quick food establishments and not even meaning fast food, Mm -hmm. even diners and things. I think of any post-war American buildup as being the kind of thing that contributed to people not engaging in that practice. Absolutely. As much. Definitely. And there's this very key differentiation I make between it being a necessity and it being pursued. I really Mm. do pursue home food preservation because the truth is that you and I could go online, we could go to a store, we could go to a farmer's market, and chances are we would have everything we need that was prepared by the hands of someone else. Mm -hmm. And that's wonderful. I'm so grateful to live in 2024 where there's so many, there's so much access to what we want and need, right? right? And I ask myself this question, even if it's accessible to me via hands that prepared it that are not my own, does that mean I myself don't want to prepare it, right? Right. So just because something is externally accessible to us, does that mean we outsource everything? Does that mean we delegate everything? Does that mean we take something that was once valuable to us and allow it to be done for us instead of doing it for ourselves? And My answer to that question in many scenarios is yes, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Right. I am more than happy and more than grateful for the city of Nashville, for example, to provide me with clean drinking water. Mm-hmm. I'm not purifying and filtering my own water, right? Right. But one thing that I would like to keep in my hands and in my home is the way I save my own food. Sure. And the way I reduce my own food waste. There's plenty of things I outsource, but what matters to me to keep, right, to keep for myself, to teach and enjoy, to and with my family, it's important in 2024 to really ask ourselves that question because so much can be outsourced, so much can Mm -hmm. be delegated. But I think where we derive so much meaning is ensuring we keep valuable practices close to home Mm -hmm. that do indeed bring us meaning and fulfillment. Right. I think one of the main themes I try and keep moving in my life is moderation and balance. Absolutely. And I think that the thing you're talking about is something that we sort of as a culture, as humans, I believe very much in the power of uh, subliminal things. Mm -hmm. So the notion of having some things that are outsourceable and quick, because I think that there's some measure of, like it or not, the pace of the world is, is moving. And I think that it's, at least for me, impossible not to understand that you need to like stay in that to some degree. I agree. Being the kind of people that are like off the grid to be totally out of that, like 
I respect everyone's decisions, but I think that as a citizen of any kind of modern society, like we have to be accepting of the pace at which things move. And so I think that there's an easy endorphin hit from being able to Amazon Prime things right. and have stuff quickly right. and fast casual food and things like that. Not necessarily, you know, the major fast food problems, but there there's a lot of middle ground that is quick and accessible. And, you know, especially through the pandemic with the rise of delivery and things like that. I think that it's easy to fall into a trap of relying entirely on that mm -hmm. and not, you know, take some autonomy back of that and do things like preservation or the amount of people who can't cook. Right. A lot of this also, you know, filters into education and mm -hmm. educating our next generations and things like that to upkeep things like that. Yes. Um, you know, we don't have any children, but it is important to me that when we do that, you know, they be able to see good examples of that. 100%. And learn how to, you know, learn skills that may not be accessible to them in their, you know, horizontal social right. structure. Definitely. And things like that. Definitely. I couldn't agree with you more. And this is something I, I think about often, this idea mm -hmm. of do I embrace what is accessible to me and do I, quote unquote, keep up with the pace mm -hmm. of our culture and technological advances, something like AI is coming to mind, do I embrace it or do I resist it and try to stay as quote unquote off the grid as I can in a way that works well for me, mm -hmm. right? And I'm with you in the sense that these are the times in which we are living and I find it far more beneficial and exciting to not only embrace the pace of our growth as a culture, but to to dr help drive it. Yeah, absolutely. To help drive it. And so when I think about something like home food preservation that has been around for a long time, the question is not, should I stop doing this completely or should I do it in such an intense way that I that I do do it in this, quote unquote, off the grid way? But the question is rather, how do I do this in a way that makes sense in 2024, mm -hmm. right? So I'm teaching home food preservation classes over Zoom, which might feel very incongruous at the outset, but it's sure. not at all. It's how it's how I can share this very meaningful skill set in a world where Zoom classes are now accessible. It's mm -hmm. very exciting to me. And even though it presents a bit of juxtaposition, it's it is still it's relevant, right? I'm I'm taking advantage of the technological advances accessible to me and teaching something I love so much through those technological advances. I will also say that something like home food preservation, even though we're now living in a very modern technological world, the process of it has remained the same. And it's very mm. manual outside of, you know, industrialized factories. Mm -hmm. The way we create a safely canned good, we are still following the same process that we did at the turn of the 18th century, right? We're still Absolutely. using heat and glass jars, and we are counting on heat manipulating pressure to create a sealed airtight container. We yep. do that in the same exact way that the founding chefs and scientists of home food preservation did it. And that to me is incredible, right? Yeah, absolutely. So again, the question is, how can we take a meaningful practice from history and apply it to the very modern world in which we are living? I'm thinking about something like, even something like exercise, right? Mm -hmm. we've, been, we've been moving our bodies as human beings for as long as we've been around, right? Yes. But what does it look like to move our bodies in a safe, healthy way in 2024 compared to in 19, or I'm sorry, 1795 or something right. like that? We now have more access to healthy shoes and things like electrolyte water, right? right? So yeah. how do we take these long withstanding practices that are not going away anytime soon mm -hmm. and just 
incorporate and integrate them into a very advanced world? It's a very exciting question to me. Yeah. And you mentioned, I mean, you used the word before. I'm very big on words. I love that. This is what it's like in half the time that I am with my therapist. It is (laughs) being like, what's the right word for this? Totally. And she knows to do it now, too. Like, therapy is not cheap. I'm sure that when it comes down to it. Yes. I waste a fair amount of the money that I spend on therapy being like, what's the right word to describe this thing? No, totally. Because you're after accuracy and precision in terms of describing your emotions, right. which is Absolutely. very important. I'm very after accurate. I, I am going for accuracy and precision yes. in everything. Yes. Unfortunately. Yes. Well, that, um, that's what makes you so good at what you pursue. Yeah. You uh, care about its quality. Well, it can also be a detriment, though. For sure. Um, Because I am definitely prone to being the kind of person that is like, well, if it's not going to be like this or something, then is it worth doing? Right. Um, That is the like struggle that I fight against. Well, let's come back to that because I, I relate deeply to that. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm curious what words stood out to you, but I would love to come back to that, Mm. that blessing and curse of what sounds like, perfectionism or something right. adjacent yeah. to perfectionism, because I would like to discuss that. It's something I relate to very deeply. Oh, great. Uh, the word that you used was tweak. Mm-hmm. And that is sort of, I think, the right thing for even what you're talking about in terms of exercise, which, by the way, you mentioned having access to good shoes and it sent a mental picture to me that can you imagine in the 1700s how bad people's feet hurt all the time? All the time. I would imagine that that is like an undocumented part of history that must have been really terrible. I'm certainly not an anthropologist or exercise historian in any way. I I reckon our feet were much stronger because we didn't rely on the support of Nike's latest sneaker. Right. And (laughs) I'm sure we were far more uncomfortable in more ways than one. I think. Oh, absolutely. Along with all of the advances we've touched on, we are, on average, more comfortable yeah. in 2024 than in 1795 yeah, or whatever right. year I made yeah, up. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, but uh, that aside, thinking about saying like tweaking things like that, right. and you mentioned how you are taking these older or not older. See, that's the thing. It's like older isn't a good word for canning and preservation you know Mm -hmm. a more unchanged and long withstanding practice yes and tweaking it to make it modern yes and how have you done that i think first and foremost the way i speak about it goes a long way so yes it's long withstanding yes it's established and again it's still highly applicable and relevant to Anyone who interacts with food in their daily life, which is all of us, because Mm -hmm. we have to to survive. I think my approach to photography of canned goods is very intentional in this way. I'm trying to show how a jar of strawberry jam fits beautifully into a downtown home, Mm -hmm. right? As opposed to some sort of um home or farm in mm-hmm. rural Tennessee. Right. I live very close to downtown mm-hmm. and my water bath canning pot and my jars of jam fit right in in that mm-hmm. environment. And so I'm trying to very truthfully discuss that and teach that because I deeply believe it. Mm-hmm. And I'm also trying to visually represent how a jar of jam or a jar of canned peaches does indeed look really cool and aspirational in many ways. Mm -hmm. And I also think that we, in a post-COVID world, are more awakened to the value of Mm self-sufficiency. Again, this is, this kind of falls under this topic of something that has, something that was once necessary, self-sufficiency in past times was much more necessary. Now, self-sufficiency 
it's still necessary, but it might be more of a choice we make, right, to be self-sufficient. And thinking about what it means to be more self-sufficient in 2024 is a very valuable question to ask ourselves. Mm -hmm. Thinking about what it means to be autonomous and independent in the ways that we can feels like, again, a highly relevant and modern question to ask. Mm -hmm. So one of my answers to those questions is one way I can be self-sufficient, one way I can remain autonomous is to prepare, enjoy, and save food long-term myself. So I really try to be thoughtful about how I speak about this practice, how I show it, how I write about it. And how I practice it because it is, in my opinion, still so highly relevant and therefore Mm -hmm. modern. Yeah, absolutely. And that, I mean, that is a great explanation of the thing that I said that you managed to make it so like fresh and vibrant and like modern instead of, uh, if I may be so crass. Sure. An old woman in a house coat and like curlers, you know, sitting, you know, in a in a tchotchke kitchen 100%. canning thing. Yes, like that is, sure. I think, the thing that when you think about that practice comes up. Yeah. And your entire, I'll use the word aesthetic, but I don't think aesthetic is the right word. It's deeper than that. It's mm-hmm. aesthetic and substance um, yeah. focus towards you Thank know, being you. the opposite of that. Definitely. That does feel very intentional. I I am certainly inspired by the very specific vision of my grandmother who you know, is and was an older woman in her kitchen full of mm-hmm. tchotchkes and yeah. collectibles and everything. But the substance she created was so worthy. But that's not me, right? That's not me in 2024. My, I like exactly what you said to show it yeah. and to sustain it in a far more minimal modern way. Yeah. And to be fair, I... I do want to point out that I did not mean that connotation, which I know you're no, I, not at I'm all. Not taking it that way. No, no, but no. But in terms of all. just clarity, like that, totally. that is not a negative thing whatsoever. No. But it is definitely like the predominant. Totally. Like, it's the stereotype. Yeah, right. For sure. Absolutely. For sure. Yeah. And I think that um, this is the first time I'll ever do this in a podcast. Be like, I have your book sitting <laughs> right next to me. Um that has never happened before, or th- <laughs> this is the first time that that has and will Great, maybe I'm happen. honored. <laughs> but I think that, uh, you know, I was just kind of going through it again last night in terms of just some prep stuff. It sort of, I think, is the modern Bible for this kind of thing. That's and, so kind. Well, I think that, one, because your personal story is so important to it. Thank you. Um, But then it launches into you know, a history of farmlands and gardening and a history of canning. And then you have, you know, there are chemical equations in here. (laughs) Always. You know, things like that. Like it, it is real and covers everything in a way that something that could easily appear to be a lifestyle book, as many cookbooks can tend to be, just end up being, you know, lifestyle shelf books. For sure. Isn't like if one is willing to dive into this, it's all here. Thank you. You know, and I think that that is a great accomplishment for one. I think that's valuable and especially something that hopefully getting younger people who may have never experienced preservation to be like, it's all here. That means so much to me because as someone in my position, someone who teaches people how to safely preserve food long term, It's critical to me that I teach an understanding, not a memorization. So my favorite professors and teachers taught me to think and intuit and and understand the subject at hand. What's very important to me for someone in my class or someone reading my book is that they have an opportunity to understand exactly what is happening in their kitchen when they are creating a jar of strawberry jam. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of canning books out there that are full of far more recipes, 
potentially far more photos. Mm -hmm. But what I really care about and care about doing well is teaching a deeper understanding of home food preservation, which is why I did prioritize the science of canning, Mm -hmm. which is why I did prioritize the history of canning, because We will be more confident in ourselves. We will be more fulfilled in our work when we understand what we're doing and not just when we are applying something we've memorized. Mm -hmm. There's a big difference. So, again, my goal is for the reader or for the student to really have a deep intuition for home food preservation so they can customize recipes safely, so they can take breaks mid recipe at a time that's appropriate to do that if they need to because mm-hmm. they understand what they're doing they're not just regurgitating information they are applying an understanding yeah absolutely this is sort of an aside i mean an applicable aside i think but one thing it spoke to me i'm very i think about education a lot mm-hmm. just overall education yes. how how we do it, how we fail to do it, yes. how we don't appreciate it. Like education and the modern society are in a strange crossroads. Right. This is something I don't know. And I will ask in case you know it. But if you don't, it's OK. The science behind canning mm-hmm. is relatively basic science. It is. And. I think that the modern adult is scared of science. Totally. People that are our age, because we're relatively the same age, Mm -hmm. I think are the generation of people that go around saying, like, science class was worthless to them. Mm -hmm. Whether it was implemented badly in their lives or they didn't care or whatever it was, I think that it's hard to think of like simple, you know, acidity and things like that as something that you learn and maybe never retain. But it is such a simple concept. And when applied to food preservation, you know, will enhance your life greatly. Totally. Do you think this is, I guess, the question that I was thinking, like, do you I wonder if you know this or not? Mm -hmm. Do you think that older generations were aware of the science of it in a natural way because the way that we perceive education as well is a relatively modern thing you know from the one room schoolhouse like in the grand scheme of things that is not that many generations ago right no not at all and so i think about how to educate somebody on something like acidity and if like previous generations of food preservationists really knew that yeah or not that's a great question yes in some ways and no in some ways Mm -hmm. right so i think in past generations something like food preservation it was far higher stakes Mm -hmm. and so we had to have a deeper appreciation and a deeper understanding of what we were doing, because if those jars of food spoiled, our food spoiled and our sustenance for the season spoiled. So it was a huge deal to do it right. Whereas now, if we have a jar of something that has gone bad, we can drive to an array of grocery stores to replace it. Yeah. So in many, many ways, home food preservation is far lower stakes today. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. So I do think there was a much deeper respect for the science of canning and food preservation because there had to be. Yeah. It was a time when these jars of food were used necessarily, Mm -hmm. right, as opposed to by choice. Now, do I think we understood the pH scale and alkalinity and acidity and the detail we do in 2024? Maybe not, because science is always moving forward. It's never moving backwards. So if we live in 2024 compared to 1940 or something like this, we just have such a deeper understanding of scientific principles. Mm -hmm. Now, I feel deeply committed to taking advantage of that. Sure. 
So even though canning is much lower stakes for me, I also have access to so much scientific information and therefore I want to access it, right? I want to understand it and I want to apply it and I want to teach it. So yes, I feel like to answer your question, there was a greater understanding of it in the sense that there had to be, right? Mm -hmm. We had to know that we were acidifying foods properly to create safely canned goods. And I think today we have a greater understanding of the intricacies of the scientific principles themselves, but we probably feel less pressure to apply them because so much is accessible to us at grocery stores. It's interesting that you say it that way because without us diving deep into this, I think things that used to come naturally to people require some effort. Right. And so something like, uh, and I say this with great envy Mm -hmm. um, of an older time, Mm -hmm. because you saying that about the necessity is 100% right. That is an incredible point. Mm -hmm. Now, so that would mean that properly doing it was much more crucial. Yes. But without so much of an ability to understand, it's odd how much more perfected they were able to make that with less access to you know great scientific theorems and stuff like that definitely that apply to that definitely i think when we know we are highly limited so in the very early days of home food preservation we had severe limitations right we not everyone had a refrigerator not Mm -hmm. everybody had a freezer if anyone at all right yeah absolutely and Therefore, we were extremely limited. And when we are limited, we, in many ways, have higher standards because things are higher stakes. Whereas now we have so much access and so few limitations that we allow ourselves to take processes less seriously. Mm -hmm. And there are pros and cons to that. I think in a world of food safety, of course, we must take it seriously 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. But in a world of creativity, we almost long for limitless possibility, whereas I think that could actually be very harmful to the creative process. I think we need limitation to maintain high standards and high stakes to create something of deep quality. So all of that to say, I definitely think the process was taken much more seriously And therefore, the science was taken much more seriously because the entire process is indeed scientific. Yeah, for sure. I'm glad I grabbed the book. I wasn't sure that I would, but it reminded me of something that I think is very bold of you in this book. Awesome. Um, In the introduction and on this page, that's, you know, how to use the cookbook. I love that the first one is to begin, you know, to do something and, uh. Maybe we'll tie that back into that need for perfection totally. and things before beginning. But the thing that I wanted to bring up is the next one, which is trust my guidance. Yes. And I think that that is a very bold request of the reader. Yes. I don't think that that would happen in the majority of even instructive books. Yeah. It's interesting because maybe it wouldn't happen in the majority of instructive books because of the fact that it is instructive and so you're trusting that person's guidance implicitly. But I think there's something refreshing about you saying it out loud. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for recognizing that. My standard for myself is sky high in terms of what I will confidently teach. So I will only confidently teach something when I know it to be true and reliable. Mm -hmm. I think when we have access to so much information, we can easily convince ourselves we have more expertise than we do. Yeah. And we do not. I think there are very few experts on any given topic at any given time. I refer to this era as the death of expertise. Definitely. And... When writing this cookbook and when approaching Wiley as a whole, I'm very committed to staying in my very narrow lane. Mm -hmm. So in this cookbook is actually quite simple 
in its substance. So I do not, in this cookbook, I do not touch pressure canning. I do not touch fermentation, dehydration. It's very simple and traditional in terms of recipe creation. Mm -hmm. And the topics that I do touch on, the science of canning, the recipes themselves, I am deeply confident in. And therefore, there are likely fewer recipes in this book than you might find in another canning book on the shelf. Mm -hmm. And I spend far more time and far more ink and pages on the science of canning as opposed to the history of farmland, for example, because mm -hmm. I'm not a, I'm of not course. an agricultural yeah. historian. Right. So I am confident in my understanding of biology and chemistry and physics because I was a biology major mm -hmm. and because I Again, the scientific concepts in the cookbook are very simple. Of course, yeah. I am by no means identifying as an expert in biology. Yeah. I am very comfortable exploring biology. Right. So all of that to say, I feel confident saying something like, trust my guidance because my guidance is very narrow, mm -hmm. right? And what I share in this book, I am very committed to and I understand very intuitively and very deeply. Beyond that, I will honestly answer, I don't know, or I'd mm -hmm. like to further research that, or this is the expert I would like to introduce you to or refer you to. Mm -hmm. But my fulfillment comes from knowing a topic really well and deeply yeah. as opposed to broadly. And if I know a topic only broadly, I don't feel comfortable teaching it. Absolutely. When I know a topic intimately, I feel very comfortable teaching it and want anyone in my presence or anyone who takes my class to value information in that same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that the scope of the book, if we, you know, if we evaluate it as there being no other access to your guidance. If this book was the only thing that you had, right? You know, if you sent it down from a mountaintop <laughs> to people, that, <laughs> totally. that it is complete. Yeah. Which is what I, I said before about it being like the modern Bible of that. And I think that it goes into those very tried and true thoughts that like it's better to teach methodology mm -hmm. than specifics. Agreed. And things like that. Absolutely. And so I think that you through this book are teaching a strong foundation or a complete foundation and that you are creating like more choose your own adventure of it. And yes. you can go, you can go much further than this book. 100%. But if you uh, end up going off the rails, you can always return to the foundation that is set by this Definitely. and be solid. Definitely. Um, I think that's a hard thing sometimes is when you get too off base or without a tether. Right. Without something to be tethered to. Right. And I think that the totality of this book is is something that someone exploring food preservation can feel tethered to. Thank you. That is very validating and it means so much because that is my goal with it. I want people to to go off base and to allow themselves to venture off knowing what they can and cannot change about a recipe or right. about the process mm -hmm. right so when they understand the foundations of canning then they can safely decide how to customize a recipe how to get off quote-unquote base with a recipe without jeopardizing its safety it's why i spend so much time on the safety in science mm -hmm. because anyone who understands the science of canning will understand how to make it their own yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, so let's go back to the thing about perfection. Totally. That you understand. So you had said you have a hard time committing to something if you don't, if you are not able to do it well or yes. to the best of your capabilities. Right. Yeah. And I relate to that so much and spent so much time being faced with that while writing the Wiley Canning Company cookbook because I wanted it to be as free of error as possible, sure. right? Or in other words, they wanted it to be as perfect as possible. And what I've learned 
about my own perfectionism, and I would be curious to know how you relate to this, is my relationship with perfectionism is always present. Mm -hmm. And my goal is not to eradicate the relationship with it. It's to have a healthy relationship with it, right? Because as much as I have tried to become a non-perfectionist it's it's so difficult to do because standard and quality mean a lot to me but i don't want it to ever cost me progression right mm-hmm. so knowing that i could create an imperfect cookbook and it very much is there are typos sure. in it for yeah. sure of course it could have stopped me from writing it all together mm-hmm. so what i did and what this cookbook taught me this is writing this taught me this for the very first time is I could prioritize my perfectionism. And what Mm -hmm. I mean is I had limited time to write this cookbook. I was on a deadline Mm -hmm. from my publisher. It was going to the printer, whether I liked it or not, on a very certain day. Uh And so I had to say, what about this book has to be as perfect as possible? And what about this book can be more flexible? Mm -hmm. And I prioritized that. So, for example, in the section about the science of canning, that section and those formulas and the way I communicated that, that felt like it had to be as perfect as possible. The recipes had to be as perfect as possible. They have to work, right? They have to have a high efficacy. Mm -hmm. But a photo of a canned jar doesn't have to be as perfect as I see it in my mind. If it's a cloudy day instead of a sunny day, I don't need to wait for a sunny day to photograph it. I need to photograph it on the cloudy day and get it submitted, right? Mm -hmm. So I think about this idea of perfectionism and the fact that I don't think it's going away anytime soon. So therefore, I need to have a healthy relationship with it. And what that means for me is choosing what to remain committed to in terms of quality Mm -hmm. and what to let be more fluid and Mm free-flowing. And so after writing this cookbook and after realizing that that process really worked for me emotionally, (laughs) right, I have applied that to my life. So what areas of my life can I give myself permission to take really seriously allow to have really high standards the answer is not all areas right Right, we have to choose very carefully what we what we want to maintain high standards around and thinking about those buckets thinking about what areas of my life deserve my all okay i know what those things are now everything else can have a bit more surrender, right? So to me, that feels like a much more realistic way to approach the condition of perfectionism is to say it's it it is here, but how can we best and most realistically channel it Mm -hmm. so that we don't constantly feel confined by it, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm curious if you relate to that at all. I'm curious if you say to yourself, these areas of my life deserve very high standards, very high qualities, but the rest can receive some surrender, right? Yeah. I think for me, and this is why I joked that uh, this should just be a podcast of you life coaching, (laughs) is um, I think those things managed to happen for me. I don't know that they happened with intention. I think that it happens with necessity because obviously uh, I was thinking as you were describing your process that uh, it's nice that you don't just uh, go head on into a psychotic rage of trying to strive for perfection all over instead of, you know, uh, surrendering, as you said. Yeah. One of the most interesting, like, unintentional cathartic things for me has been some of the... uh, some of the things surrounding having started a podcast right? and being committed to why do I listen to so many podcasts that have terrible sound and saying, well, I want every episode to have optimal sound. Beautiful. However, I can do it with 
who I'm interviewing and where they are or things like that. Right. And, um, you know, for instance, it was a long time before I should say a long time. Uh, this is only the 11th episode, but uh, <laughs> it was a while before I had to do the first Zoom interview mm-hmm. and with some or with someone that wasn't recording themselves on the other end and sending me an audio file to, right. so that it sounds like we're in the same room. Right. Um, and thinking like, well, that's a compromise in terms of quality, but it's more important for the for the conversation to happen mm-hmm. than wait forever for it to happen to a time when it may not be relevant or right. circumstances change or things like that. Like right. it just didn't happen in time. So I think that that's a prioritization that is not a perfection. Definitely. Another thing is uh, talking about when certain things like the air conditioning get into microphones. And it's like, there is a version of me that would say, this is unacceptable. Right. I can't do this. Right. Or like, I'm not going to do this. However, I have prioritized the need for episodes coming out every two weeks right. on Tuesday morning. Yeah. And it's like, well, some of these, this one's just going to be this way. And it's more important for the discussion to be out there. Right. Even with some weird hum in right. the background, then it be a pristine thing. And, you know, we'll get them next time. Definitely. A thought like that. Absolutely. I relate to that deeply once again. I think for you, choosing choosing the area that feels most important. And for you, that might be the sound quality. For another podcaster, it might be frequency of episodes, mm-hmm. right? And even when we do that, there is still so much room for human error yeah, because absolutely. we are human, right? Mm-hmm. And so I relate to this because when thinking about the cookbook, even though I was so wholly committed to certain areas of perfection within the cookbook, it, again, is still highly imperfect. I could have reread and reread and reread the cookbook a thousand more times, and I still think I would have missed typos. Yeah, sure. But the most devastating outcome to me would have been to not release it at all, yeah, right? absolutely. Do I want to release a cookbook with a few typos or do I want to hold it for myself because it's not perfect? Do you want to release a podcast with a hum likely no one else will notice? Yeah. Or do you want to re-record and re-record ad nauseum until you think it's perfect? Right. Probably release it into the world and know that realistically, no one will notice of course. in the way that you do. But it takes so much self-talk, right? Mm-hmm. It takes so much self-encouragement to say, it is okay to be human. It is okay to leave room for error as someone who values such a high standard of work and output. Yeah. So two people in our position and people in similar positions who value such high quality work we really do have to practice some major self encouragement because we're not robots, right? Yeah, Unless, absolutely. Right. And yes. So I have fought very hard at different times in my life to be a robot. Yeah. <laughs> and that is not that is not it. Yes. I mean, yeah. the the reality of becoming partial robots is not that far off, right? Yeah. So that's why I hesitated there for a second a few moments back because I'm like, well, not we aren't yet. But All of that to say, we are still very much human and therefore, without a doubt, for certain, there will be error in Mm -hmm. what we create. And I think really at the end of the day, that's the beauty of it. And I will say this, once my cookbook was off to the printer and out in the world, so after both of those things were done... I subsequently discovered errors Mm -hmm. in the book. So I sent it to the printer thinking it was as perfect as possible, as well done as possible. And I didn't reread it until it came out because Mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't want to know. Right. If I don't want to know, because what I would do is email my publisher to email the printer to say, (laughs) stop printing it. We need to fix this. So then the book came out and there are typos in it. Right. Like Mm -hmm. I've mentioned. And I grieved that for a moment. And then I realized, you know what? I almost feel like this has been that truth is such a gift to me 
Because had it been typo free, Mm -hmm. had it been quote unquote perfect, imagine that becoming my standard then for the rest of my life or the rest of my work. It would have driven me absolutely insane. Mm -hmm. And I feel like now the book did come out. It isn't perfect. I'm still madly in love with it. What a relief to me that I got to experience that, that I got to experience, that I get to experience this love for something that is indeed imperfect. It really does set the rest of my work up for a bit more gentleness and a bit more compassion, which I would much rather have at the end of the day. Yeah. And at a practical level too. Exactly. The way that you waited until it was out. Yes. What I think you did that you may not recognize is you eliminated a potential pitfall in the period in which you were getting no feedback on the book. Right. And if you had been going through it, you'd have been in an echo chamber about it. Yes. Whereas finding typos after it was out, you were also already receiving positive feedback. Exactly. In a way that helps make it feel okay. Exactly. Because what is the weight of this mistake against this yes. groundswell of, you know, support? Absolutely. I think that's a fantastic point. It's really easy to get bogged down in the criticisms, even when they're self criticisms. Mm -hmm. But when you hold that up to, like you said, the immense support this book was shown, it it really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that there is a very minor typo that I don't think anybody would notice. Yeah. When at the end of the day, what I want is for this to be a book that teaches someone how to save their food long term. Mm -hmm. And it is that. Right. Yeah. So I agree with you completely. Context matters yeah so much for sure i went through a bunch of it and retained nothing of this <laughs> but i was i was doing this to get more just like of a sense i went for through sure. a number of your weekly uh newsletters that you oh send out, my gosh awesome um, and just read a whole bunch of them great and uh i want you to talk to me about what it is that you are aiming to present to other people through that. But I had one thing that I uh, that I stuck on because it is similar to something that uh, Amanda's more qualified to talk about than I am, <laughs> but I will tell you about it and you can ask her about it sometime later. Okay. You talk about how you do with your husband and son, the three thankfuls. Yeah. Can you tell me about that real fast? And then I will. Totally. So... So let me back up a little bit. At the end of the day, we've my husband, Jared, and son, Sullivan, and myself, we each just say three things we're thankful for that happened that day. And they are so simple. Mm-hmm. A lot of the time, my son says, I'm thankful for the ceiling fan, or I'm thankful for the sunshine, or I'm thankful for my pajamas. It's so simple. Of course. But what we're doing as a family and as individuals is just taking a moment to recognize what we have and what abundance is a part of our lives. And I think when we think about gratitude, sometimes we think about it very big picture. Like, what does my life look like? Big picture. What is my career? What is my house? What are my relationships? Mm -hmm. And To me, the meaning is much more granular, right? It's like, gosh, I really do like that ceiling fan. And these pajamas are so soft. And the sun is out today. And Mm -hmm. I feel that on my skin. And feeling these thin slices of gratitude, to me, really culminate into feeling abundant Mm -hmm. and that and abundance brings me so much fulfillment and groundedness so all of that to say we started doing it with our son from a very young age just to start teaching him the power of recognizing these really thin slices of Mm -hmm. joy and abundance and hardship at times right so that's what our three thankfuls are yeah so amanda's family uh, i have learned Her mom would, because they, as a family, would eat dinner together every night. Great. 
she would make them do something called highs and lows. Yes. And it was like highs and lows of the day. Yes. And that uh, felt very similar yeah. to me in terms of that kind of thing. Yeah. Amanda having some friends who have been what may essentially be called lifelong friends right. that are still in our lives. Um, they know all about highs and lows. And so we have definitely been at friend dinners and been like, what were highs and lows for this that. week and right. stuff. And uh, sometimes it's impossible to think of and you yeah. just have to, you know, sometimes they're the same thing. Right. <laughs> but definitely. Uh, I just thought that that was an interesting uh, thing I picked up out of one of your thin slices. Definitely. Things. And I was like, oh, I should ask about this and tell you about. Definitely. I love thing. that. And what I love about it, what I love about the three thankfuls and what I love about highs and lows is it's all reflection. Mm -hmm. And consideration and okay. deliberation, right? And I think going back to the truth that we live in a very fast-paced, forward-thinking society, and there's so much good in that, and we mm -hmm. want to embrace it, it is also critical to our well-being and to our humanhood to reflect and consider and deliberate on highs, on lows, on abundance, on deficit. That feels very important to me, right? I think, you know, sometimes a virtue taught to us is don't fixate on the past or be, you know, be future oriented. But sometimes I think the best thing we can do is think about past occurrences. And yeah. whether it's yesterday or whether it's last year, sometimes what brings us most meaning is reconciling and processing something that did happen in the past, right? Yeah. So teaching the power of reflection and deliberation, again, whether it's through something like the three thankfuls at night, which takes 30 seconds, yeah. or the highs and lows at dinners, that value of reflection feels deeply critical to our self-empathy and compassion and, again, humanhood. Yeah. And so I'm glad I chose that example because that, as you were describing it and thinking about how to move into asking you to describe more about the things that you write, you know, to people who are subscribers mm -hmm. and things like that. And not necessarily, you know, canning focused things, right. but so much of that is based around gratitude and thoughtfulness and right. reflection. And so tell me about, you know, valuing presenting that to other people and how, mm -hmm. how you are finding that it affects other people. So you mentioned you saw this in my weekly newsletter, mm -hmm. right? So I send a newsletter every Friday from Wiley. And part of that newsletter is a segment called Thin Slices, which is essentially what's on my mind that is highly applicable to my work, mm -hmm. right? So on the topic of gratitude and reflection, as a business owner, I can very easily fall into a mindset of scarcity or imposter syndrome because I'm so hyper aware of everything I want to do but have yet to do mm -hmm. or every tweak on the website I want to make that I have yet to make or every recipe in my notes that I have yet to publish, right? Mm -hmm. And living in that headspace robs us of joy so lightning fast. Mm -hmm. And it is a practice of mine to choose to recognize and give energy to everything I am doing and everything that does exist, right? So I know I am so, again, hyper aware of everything I want to be true for Wiley, mm -hmm. period. Yeah. It is not all true right now, sure. right? Everything I see existing through Wiley does not yet exist. Yeah, that's right. A small right. portion of it currently exists. And I want to honor what currently exists and not just long for what doesn't yet exist. Right. Absolutely. So that takes effort and that takes choice and agency. Yeah. And literally writing it down, literally writing down, this is what is true about my life today. This is what is true about Wiley today. This is what I'm proud of today. Mm -hmm. That practice does bring me a sense of peace, a huge sense of peace, an existence of peace and 
cried, right? So I incorporate that kind of language and that theme into all of my newsletters because when we see others creating so much, when we know what we ourselves have yet to create, again, we can very easily become very hard on ourselves and our work and what a waste that is because we are giving so much to the world and we are giving so much to our work and living in that headspace, one of gratitude and abundance is what feels best to me. And it's what I would want for everyone I know and love to be very proud of the work they are creating and the energy they are outputting and know that they can do it all. They just can't do it all at once. So it's something I feel is worthy of writing about. How have you seen it um, affect other people? I think sometimes people need permission to own their very unique and personal offerings and gifts and to stop and recognize what is true about their life today, right? Mm -hmm. We are constantly fed the importance of setting goals and being future-oriented. And don't get me wrong, I am very in that too, right? I love, I love setting goals and I love thinking about the future, but sometimes I think we all need permission to just say, what did I want a year ago that is true about my life today? Right. Yeah. Or what am I, Chelsea O'Leary, good at that I can offer uniquely and personally to the world? And can I give myself permission to really own that and be confident in that? And I think sometimes Others need that permission, too. So the response has been one of relief and inspiration and camaraderie and shared confidence, right? Mm -hmm. My gifts are not the same as someone else's gifts, and my interests are obviously not the same as someone else's. But what if we both fully owned what those things were? Then we can build a community that is so rich and diverse and abundant and what we can offer, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... I would say overall, the response has seemed very meaningful and um, confidence boosting. That's great. Just because I think that all of the things you're saying are true. Right. In terms of people needing permission, people needing to feel understood mm-hmm. or, you know, related to. Right. I think that's a thing that we miss out on a lot is like we are so often called to relate to things mm-hmm. but we are often not felt related to definitely by other people absolutely and it's um you know it's one of the things that i classify as an introvert mm-hmm. some people even guests on this podcast have said that that cannot possibly be true mm-hmm. however i think it's some combination of that and like a social battery of course. That, you know. It's so okay. I think it's very possible to be a social introvert. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. There are some circumstances under which I will be full introvert. Right. Um, but most of the time I would say it is some social introversion. Totally. But I think that when the book Quiet, which yes, is about Susan Kane. Yeah, Susan Kane. When that book came out, I think that it made people feel related to it made introverts feel related to definitely instead of them having to relate because that is sort of the problem inherently in introversion is like you don't feel like you relate to things right i have learned as an adult that there are periods of my life that i didn't relate to the people that i thought i was supposed to be relating to right and it caused great self-consternation of course (laughs) um which, as a, an aside, that book is incredible in the same way I think that your book is incredible in that she starts out with a history of business principle books yeah. of how that is geared towards forcing introverts to be extroverts. Absolutely. And thinking that you know there's something wrong with you if you are not. Absolutely. And uh, my base teacher in college was very big on making us read success principles books. And I never quite felt that way. What I will say about him doing that is it 
made me and other students of his feel more invested in yes. because he wasn't trying to just make us play the bass better. Definitely. He was trying to teach us how to be better, well-rounded humans. Right. And he wouldn't do that to just anybody, but it was like one of those kinds of things. Luckily, I never felt that I was supposed to be an extrovert from that. However, when I read that in her book, I thought, oh, that makes perfect sense. Definitely. Now. And uh, I wanted to bring up that point just because I think that it's very much the same as the, some of the things that you do in the, in the cookbook. Thank you. But my point in, in bringing that up was to say that that is a thing of feeling related to right. instead of feeling like you have to relate. Definitely. Sometimes the world has to come to you. Definitely. <laughs> instead of you coming out of your bubble into the world. For sure. For sure. I one of my favorite um one of my favorite quotes about feeling and not feeling understood is the quote, loneliness does not come from being alone. It comes from an inability to communicate what matters most to us. Yes. Or it comes from an inability to feel understood. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think in a, again, modern creative world, so many of us long to feel understood as humans, as creatives, as entrepreneurs, as artists, whatever it is. And when we feel like we do not feel understood, that is what I think can cause loneliness and feelings of isolation because we're so surrounded by people, right? Mm -hmm. And we're so connected. We've never been more connected. No, absolutely not. But I think we might be, I think we might be risking feeling understood more than ever. Mm -hmm. So I absolutely relate to that. And on your note about Susan Kane. It is so interesting because I do feel like we live in a society that values and rewards extroversion, yeah. right? So many of our leaders are incredibly charismatic and effervescent and vibrant, right? And we are taught to value that and yeah. to strive for that. But having more reserved natures and more quiet natures it's like equal and oppositely valuable, mm -hmm. right? And I do think over time, as a society, we are embracing that more and more. Yeah. Thank goodness. My husband, Jared, is very reserved. And when we first started dating, I remember feeling exactly what you're describing. I almost wanted him to assimilate to my bubbliness and mm -hmm. more extroversion but i was then inadvertently communicating that that personality trait was more valuable and it is not sure yeah and now i perceive his reserved nature as so complimentary and valuable in my life and i know when he speaks up about a topic it is so worth listening to right mm -hmm. so all of that to say i think and hope we are coming around societally to value more consideration and reservation in people well whether it's genuine or not when you were describing so many leaders and you know business leaders and things like that you know ceos are essentially leaders at this right, point right. in in the world that often when they quote things they're quoting the quiet ones definitely you know which is an interesting thought that yeah. they're their presentation is so loud. Right, right. Um, and, or amplified is right. a good way to put that. Right. Yet almost everybody in a high position or a position of loudness is so often quoting, you know, reserve people. Right, definitely. Um, and so I think there's a lot to mine yes, in there. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Thank you so much for being here. Of Thank course. Thank you so much for this chat. That was great. I am very thankful for the uh, place that you are at in your journey. Thank you. And uh, we could do a whole nother discussion on uh, five-year plans and 10-year plans and uh, the balance between that and where we're at. But uh, maybe sometime we'll do this again. That'd be great. And we will find out uh, all the things that you are <laughs> thankful for that you have gained. Thank you so much. It was such a joy to talk with you. Awesome. You as well. Thank you. I feel like we could keep talking for hours and hours. Oh, my gosh.
Hey, that was really great, right? I had such a good time talking to Chelsea, and I hope you had just as good of a time listening to it. I don't know when, I don't know why, but uh, I'm sure that she's going to be back. We had so much that we could have continued talking about, but all of that was so good quality, and I just wanted to make sure we got a great package in there. I guess I'm starting to say this all the time, but if this is your first, fifth, tenth, fourth, or maybe someone's out there going for the full 11 episodes of Matt O'Donnell Wants to Know, thank you so much for being here. I can only do this if you are listening. If you haven't already done so, please follow the show on Instagram. That is at Matt O'Donnell Wants to Know. My own self-gratuitous stuff. Is this self-gratuitous? Do I have two self-gratuitous? Never mind. That's too much of a rabbit hole to go down now, but my own page on Instagram is at Matt O'Donnell. You can write into the show and tell me about the dust in my bedroom at Matt O'Donnell wants to know at gmail.com. Don't forget to do all the things that every podcaster asks you to do. Like the show, review the show, subscribe to the show, share it with your friends. Don't forget there is a YouTube version of the show, which can often be the easiest way to share it, but every little bit helps. And as Chelsea was saying, I am very thankful for where I am already at with you and with the show. That will do it for this time. Take some time for yourself today and do something nice. And remember, the best answer to a question is usually another question. See ya!